there is a presence there that is overwhelming. You are experiencing something beyond your normal human experience. And as I'm watching this, I'm reflecting. What's go I mean, I'm feeling it. I'm sensing this, this incredible power in this place that's being shared by all these insane, rabid football fans. And the, dawn, the revelation comes to me in, in a, just a moment. I mean, it was like God just spoke and he said, football is their religion and this is their church. And I thought, you're absolutely right. I felt what I was experiencing amongst these rabid football fans was in many ways similar to what I experience in worship. There's something going on here that's beyond me, and it's really powerful, and it's shaking me, and I can sense it. And, I, and then, I'm see, now I'm trying to put it together. Like, I get worship. I understand that. But this thing over here that's happening amongst these ungodly, rabid people, which is including me, and we're having this crazy experience together, how do I explain this? I mean, is this just occult activity? Like, is, is football really as evil as my wife tells me is it, it is? So I start to think about it. And this is my explanation that I think is, I think is right. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So we're without excuse. Romans 1.20. What Romans 1.20 is saying is that, and this is a fantastic revelation, that the very nature and characteristics of God we can learn from nature. He has, he has expressed his divine nature through creation. And that creation doesn't just mean the birds and the bees and the trees and the lakes and the rivers. It means us, too. He has made us in his image, so therefore we can understand much about God from looking at ourselves because we're little expressions. Not very good. I mean, we mess it up, but we're still built in his image. And it tells us that we can find evidence of him in how we do culture together, how we do life together. It's not just as individuals that we can discover things of his nature. It's by looking at what happens amongst us. God has used the natural world to express and communicate his essence. So built into it is the character of God to be found. Now this is interesting, and here's my point. Because of all things about God that's amazing. What's amazing is his unity. How can, how can God uh, be unity? Well, how can God be love? In order to be unity or, or to be love, God has to be more than one. You know, I'm not united with myself. I'm just myself. But if I have a friend, I can be united with my friend. And love is never in the absence of something to love. You never get up in the morning filled with love and throw open your windows and say, I'm so full of love right now, I love nothing at all. That doesn't happen. Love has to have an object. So in our God is unity because our God is three. Our God is like an eternal family. Love in love with love. I like to think of the Father, Son, and the Spirit of a triangle, points of a triangle. Love in love with love. And the love just keeps traveling from one to the next, never staying for long because that would be self-glorification. Self he's also blessing. He's always blessing. They're always blessing one of the others. So built into nature is something to do with unity because God is unity and he is a relationship. And so we can find in nature... A relationship, now this is really interesting, between unity and power. 
See, God is all-powerful, but he's also perfectly united, and he's three in one. So creation, because it reflects his divine essence, is what Paul is saying. We should be able to find a relationship in nature that indicates the connectedness between unity and power. Are you tracking with me so far? All right. That's the NFL experience. It is. It explains why things like this move us when we come together in unity and we find ourselves caught up in something greater than ourselves. And we actually experience an outpouring of power. He is three in one. He is perfect power. We should be able to find a relationship between unity and power in creation. And the fact is we do. It's called synergy. Synergy. That the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That something happens when you bring people together. When it's, it's true in chemistry, you guys. I got a background in pre-med. It's, it's true in, in chemistry. It's, cr it, it's true in biology. There is this connection between unity and power. It exists at the molecular level, right up into the animal kingdom and people. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I was doing research on this many years ago, working on this idea. And I started looking at synergy in human affairs and, and in, even in the animal kingdom. And here's a really neat example. There was a county fair in which they had a plow horse competition. And these, these plow horses are big, strong animals, and they drag heavy plows, used to, through the ground to break up the ground to harrow it in order for uh, crops to grow well. So they had two finalists in the competition. One horse pulled 700 pounds. The winner pulled 800 pounds. And somebody got the idea right then spontaneously at the fair, well, you know, seven, 800, why don't we put them together and see if they can pull 1,500 pounds? That'd be really something. Just add it up. He can do seven, he can do eight. Let's bring them together. So they brought them together. How much did they pull? 2,000 pounds. More than double what either of them could pull alone. It's absolutely amazing. God has built into nature the principle that more power is released when we function in unity than when we are divided. And we see this in human affairs and we see this in the Bible. Uh, there's a fabulous, absolutely wonderful illustration of this in the Old Testament. Unity leading to power. Can anyone think of the story? Hello? It's the power of Babylon. It's an incredible story. I mean, listen, listen to this. I'm just going to paraphrase because we're not going to dissect this story because it's merely an illustration of something else. But here's the story. God creates mankind, and he, he blesses mankind with unity. And that is symbolized by one language. So here they are functioning together. The beginning of civilization. This is, this is the birth of, of what is going to be the blueprint for civilization. And they have unity and they have one language. And they get this cockamamie idea that just happens to be true. That if we work together, we can elevate ourselves to God. There isn't anything we can't do if we're not united. And so they begin building the tower, which, by the way, this is the beginning of humanism. What we call humanism today begins in, in, in this place, in this moment. So it's a very powerful thought that's dominated through human history up until today and will continue to dominate because it's human nature. But that's another point. So they have their one language and they have their dream. We're going to build a tower to elevate ourselves to heaven, make ourselves equal with God. And God's reaction is really frightening. He's speaking to the heavenly host and he says, well, if we let them do this, there's nothing they can't do. This is God. There's nothing they can't do. If they're united, they can do anything. And we're not going to have that. We're not going to allow that. That's just going to lead to more pride. 
So we'll frustrate their unity by breaking up their languages into tribes and subcultures. And they'll never be able to come together again and make a threat to, against us like this. And that explains the world we live in. Here we are, the fruit of this disunity. We're tribal in our relationships. We're racist in our relationships. We're elitist in our relationships. We us and them ourselves. So God cursed humanity with disunity. And it's been that way ever since, but this is the most wonderful but. There's one exception. One exception. Where he didn't curse with disunity, he blessed with unity. And who is that one exception? The church. We are. We get, we get the blessing. We don't have to be cursed with disunity. And we can experience synergy. We can experience the relationship between unity and power because we have been blessed with divinely ordained unity. And the NFL. And the NFL. Well, in God's world, you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Through the VCR. With one exception, and here it is. And um, in pre-service prayer, not knowing what we were going to talk about, I think Rod or Gary, one of the two of them, read this out. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred people in community, related family relationships, when they come together in unity, it is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard on the beard of Aaron. It's symbolic of, of the blessing of God. Running down over the collar of his robes, it's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained, which means commanded, blessing. So there's this relationship between his blessing and unity. Rod read that. And God has commanded his blessing to his church when it lives together in unity. That's available to us. But most of the time, we don't buy the product. When I started researching this 20 years ago, actually more than 20 years ago, it was a real passion on my heart. So I did a lot of research. At that time, according to the best estimates, there were 25 going on 26,000 different Christian denominations. That was then. Now it's over 50,000. We seem to be better at dividing than we are at coming together. So we're not partaking and enjoying the blessing of unity, not as a universal church. But God still commanded the blessing and it's still there to be had. All we have to do is live into it. it. Means we have the power that flows from unity which has been built into creation and beyond that that's been promised by God through his Holy Spirit living amongst us, living amongst us, living amongst us, living together. We see this same message in Jesus, and, and we don't interpret this very well, but we need to pause and think about this because it's really important. We see this in Jesus' instructions when he's going to return to heaven. Just before he leaves, and then he sends, of course, his Holy Spirit, but before he leaves, he gives this command and this instruction to his nascent church, his little baby church. While staying with them, he ordered them ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. Acts 1.4. See, his command's in two parts, and this is really important. There's just two parts to this. The first is don't leave, and the second is wait. Now, when most of the time when we understand this passage, we focus on the second one, on waiting. You with me? 
because waiting well is a, is a biz- biblical concept from the Old Testament that's really, really important. So Jesus is repeating it. We're to wait. That's not hopelessly waiting, drumming your fingers on the table in frustration at the DMV. That's not the kind of waiting we're talking about. We're talking about waiting in anticipation of something really good. So they were to wait in anticipation. But that's where we put our attention most of the time. But the first thing he said is don't leave. So what's it mean to leave? What's he talking about? What, what, what's, the, what's the problem here that he's addressing? The word leave here usually translates as do not separate or isolate yourselves from one another. It isn't just don't move to Ramona. Not that anyone would. That, that, that wasn't funny. That was mean. It doesn't just mean don't go someplace else. It means something deeper than that. It's do not separate or isolate yourselves from one another. In some places, the word translates as divorce. Do not divorce. Don't separate yourself from the ones that I've created for you to be committed to. It's not first about moving to another place. It's about separating. And then the word wait get this, means to remain in a place or state with expectancy concerning a future event. So that state or place isn't just a physical place you're waiting in. It's the relationships you're enjoying and that you have, your unity with one another. Is this making sense? It's not too complicated? So Jesus is commanding this. Don't isolate yourselves from one another and stay in a state of unity until the promise of the Holy Spirit is fulfilled. This joins the the receipt of the Holy Spirit and the coming of His power with the state of our unity. Do you see this? We cannot do this alone. And we can't do this as a divided community. We have to be together, waiting together in expectancy of the pouring out of more of God's power. There is a relationship between power and unity. Where there is love and unity, the power will follow. When Paul describes spiritual gifts and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, everything is summed up in the first phrase. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Do you notice he's putting the love ahead of the experience of the gifts? If you, if, if you flip them, if you say, well, you know, if we desire power, love is going to happen. Not usually. Not in human affairs. But if you say, follow the way of love and power will follow love, there's a good chance it will. But we have to keep the emphasis where God wants the emphasis, which is on the quality of our community and our love and our commitment to one another. Our togetherness really, really, really matters. In fact, it's the place everything comes from. First, our connectedness with Him, and then our connectedness with our brothers and sisters. If you violate either one of those, you don't get the good things. You don't get the blessings. The blessings can be thwarted by disunity. That is why the devil's number one priority, and we see it in John 17 as Jesus is talking to the Father and he's praying for his people. And if you study it, you'll see he's not just praying for his people then and there, he's praying for us into the future that they may be, that those that believe through these followers, that they may be one even as we are one. Oh God, protect them from the enemy. Jesus is saying to his Father, protect them from the enemy that they might be one. The key to the Christian life is unity. A, with the Father. B, with every one of the rest of us. As annoying as that might be, as trying as that might be, that is where our faith is worked out and made real. Period. Stay in the state of unity until the promise of the Holy Spirit is fulfilled. So what is Satan's response to this this spiritual phenomenon of the relationship between unity and power? 
What's his number one goal pretty much all the time? Disunity. Separate you from God, separate you from your brothers and sisters. Divided, you are easily conquered. Together, you're invincible. So, okay, now, this is important. This is a little sidebar, okay, to what I'm about to say. I have this fear that when I get to heaven, it will be with some of you. I haven't finished the sentence. It will, it will be with a, it will be with a, a bunch of you. And and I have been one of the shepherd dogs, the sheep dogs designed to care for the flock. Right. So there I am with the flock of you little innocent lambs. And I'm, I'm, I'm the sheepdog. And Jesus turns to you. Let me find an illustration. Oh, heck. I'm going to make this up. No, it's got nothing to do with you. You and I are standing before Jesus, and I'm there, sheepdog, and you're there, wonderful sheep. And um, Jesus says uh, to you, Noah, I understand that you played faithfully in the worship band at church for many years. And you're kind of, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> kind of shuffling, looking at your feet, yeah, I did. Jesus says, uh, Noah, that was a sacrifice, getting up early to be there every Sunday morning and set up your gear and go through all that. That wasn't easy. Why did you do that? And in heaven, it's really hard to lie. It's this place where no matter what you want to say that's a lie, what ends up coming out of your mouth is always the truth. It's embarrassing. So he says, Noah, why, why did you sacrifice yourself like that? And, and you point to me and you go, he made me do it. He talked me into it and he guilt tripped me and he made me do it. That's why I did it. And Jesus looks at me. What have you done? You stole his reward. You stole his reward. Because you made him do it. Jesus is not happy with that. I have this fear that in the way I lead people, I will use manipulation or pressure or guilt or something or shame or something to get people to do the right thing. And when they do the right thing for the wrong motive, they don't get credit for it. And I sure won't get credit for it for treating you that way. So I have this belief that people should only do what they really want to do. And I should never try to get people to do something they don't really actually inside want to do. Which means motivating people is really hard. Because you can't threaten them, and it's a volunteer organization, so you can't cut off their pay. So you've only got really two things, love and persuasion. Persuasion through reason and, and love, hoping that somehow God's love will touch their hearts and they'll be transformed into wanting to be servants, not being forced to be servants. Does this make any sense? This is who I am as a leader. This is be, Because I grew up in a church that did the opposite to me. And I swore to God, if I'm ever in charge, I will never lead people that way. So I'm stuck. I'm stuck wanting you to change because I know it's good for you. But there's all these things I can't access, I can't use because they're actually evil. They're not godly at all. So for what I'm about to say to you, I don't want you to read this in any way that resorts to shame or manipulation or, or any of those things to try to get you to take what I'm about to say seriously. I just pray to God that the Spirit will speak to you and you'll get it. So please, if you sense any shame in this, just blow it off, okay? Just if, if you sense any shame in, in what I'm about to do, just blow it off because it's not what I intend. 
It's what the devil would like, but we won't let him have his way in this. But here's what I'm thinking about. I'm applying this whole message to COVID. What the heck does this message have to do with COVID? Well, COVID changed our habits. COVID changed how we think. COVID changed our habits. And I'm reflecting on the legacy of COVID and I'm reading studies and school teachers and educational psychologists are saying that our children aren't socializing well anymore. Their social development has stalled. I hear from parents who say their children don't have friends like they used to have. Many of them have become reclusive. Psychologists tell that depression and mental problems among our young people have increased dramatically since COVID. Well, yeah, they have. And not just amongst the young. Could this mean that COVID was a work of evil? I think so. Certainly hasn't been a work for good. Not in our culture. The fruit of this thing suggests it's, it's evil. Or it's been used for evil. No question about that. New habits, bad habits, have been created. Good habits have died. Now it's got to get fixed. What should we do about this? If we're going to change this, and if we're going to erase this legacy and have a happy ending to this mess, change always starts with the individual. If I, get to, if I try to make you change, we have the problem with you and me and Jesus in heaven. Don't want that. So somehow I want to motivate you to consider change because it's good for you and it's good for us. COVID habituated us to staying home as often as possible. And sadly, that includes coming to church and going to connect group. We became used to being a church online. Now, online community, I know for many of you, this is what you have to do. This is circumstances have put you in this place. And I get that. But for many of you, you've just been habituated and being separated from your people. And that's not a godly thing. This leads to spiritual isolation. Maybe you come once in a while when you feel like you need to. Listen, your feeling of what you need is your feeling of what you need. What you really need is what you really need. And God decides that, not your emotions. God knows what you need. And crazy as it may sound, you need to be here. There is a hole in this room that you fill. And you don't think you're important enough that when you come, you don't think it makes any difference at all. But it does. Some of you guys, when you come, it absolutely lights me up. I prayed today that you guys would be here today by name. God, please get them here today. I know it sounds crazy, but God's made this thing where we experience joy when we're with our brothers and sisters. It's just great. And you think you don't, you think it's not noticed when you're not here. I notice when you're not here. And it hurts. And I get this big smile and big happiness thing when you guys show up. It's cheesy, but it's true. No, it's, I mean, and I try to get rid of it because I don't want to feel bad. And I don't want to manipulate you, but I really want you to be here. So I'm screwed, you understand? This is really bad. This is a hard situation to be in because I don't know what to do about it except to tell you what I understand the Bible says as best I can and then pray that the Holy Spirit makes your life miserable. <laughs> I'm not above that. 
Well, then it's his problem. If he answers that prayer, it's not on me. We need to see you, and you need to be seen. And when we come together, we come together, and we sense the presence of God together, like in worship, man, that's just, to me, that's about as good as it gets. And then we experience more of his power, more of his presence. And we realize we're not really alone. And this isn't a luxury, you guys. This is a spiritual relational need. This is how he's designed us. And coming together is a spiritual relational food. So here's my suggestion. Just a suggestion. But if you follow the suggestion, you get 10% off your tithe. So you want to think about this. It's important. Here's my suggestion. COVID broke our habit of regular attendance at church and connect groups. The answer to a broken good habit that's turned into a bad habit is to get a brand new good habit. Establish a good new habit. So how about a very late New Year's Eve resolution to return to regular attendance at group in a connect, at church in a connect group. And you will be glad you did, and we will be glad you did. Amen. And we will experience more of him together. Okay, so look. Let's just shed all guilt, okay? Let's just shed all guilt. This isn't about manipulation. This is merely wisdom which you are free to apply or not apply however you want. And guess what? The leadership of this church will not love you any less if you're not regular. Everyone gets loved the same no matter what. That's just how Jesus was. But boy, please, please think about this. Please pray about this. Making that kind of pretty radical commitment. I'm going to be there because I make a difference, and it makes a difference for me. Okay? We have seven minutes. And I always like to end with taking an offering for my hair transplant. <laughs> Stop it. Um, Q&A, what, what, what do you, or comments, what do you want to say about this message? What are you thinking? Uh, what would you add to this? What are the problems? Yeah. Why don't you come up here and do it? For the online community. <laughs> we are uh, in, in the, just in the beginning of a study in our connect group on heaven. What heaven is, what it's not. And as you were teaching this, which you really did a great job, it just hit me that when we come together here, when we come together as a body, whether it's connect group or at the park, that's as close as we're going to get to heaven when we're here on earth. Yeah, I think you're right. Any questions or comments? Hmm? That's a good application. When's the next prayer and praise? Working on it. <laughs> we're working on it. These little little vignettes, you know, these little moments of heaven on earth. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Yeah. It's a great idea. You know, r remember back at the old place at uh, Mount Carmel High School, we would do that regularly, all have lunch under the, uh, the canopies where the students would have lunch during the week.
Yeah, yeah. It's a great idea. Okay. We will work on that, right? Yes. Find ways to do that. I'd like to add something. Yeah. Community is intentional. Like, building community requires intention, right? I, I say this sometimes, too, from the, from the pulpit, but an encounter with God requires participation. Like, you, you got you to gotta show up. And there's so many times in, uh, in, in youth group or connect group or just hanging out after church with somebody where it's like, yeah, I got better things to do. I got the crock pot going. I got a game to watch. I got other things I could be doing. We all have those things that we'd rather be doing. But so often, nine times out of ten, I'm glad when I push past my comfort zone and I put myself out there beyond, you know, the convenience. And then I have a conversation with somebody and the Holy Spirit shows up in that conversation and he moves powerfully right? And so, and that's what we're talking about. Community is power. There's power in a godly Christian community. So, I would, I would encourage you, if you haven't, you know, gone to a connect group, or you haven't signed up at our welcome table for one of those things, those are just simply a platform to get into a community, and you develop those friendships there, you do other events together on the side, kind of thing. Like, whoa, last night we had a UFC fight night. It was great. It was amazing. Well, we had barbecue, we watched the fight, and we got to fellowship and meet new people. Those are the types of organic events that we're talking about that are just awesome, and God shows up there. So, be intentional with it. Yes. I was just thinking about all you Ramona guys, Ramona guys, and thinking about you. You're a really good example because most of you guys work out regularly. You, you go to the gym, or you used to. One, at one time, I know you did. And it's the same thing. Like, it's a discipline to show up. And once a week in the gym is not going to make much difference, but uh, you got to do it regularly, right? But once a week at church, a connect group will make a big difference to your spiritual health. It's, it's that establishing a productive habit that's going to bless you for the rest of your life. It's always painful in the beginning, but once you get that habit working for you, it's working for you. It's good. Okay, guys. I think this idea of sharing a meal together and having that kind of experience, which we used to do easily because it was easy in those days because it was right there, isn't so easy now, but we need to find a way to do that. So we'll start working on that. But in the meantime, you've got connect groups, you've got church, you've got opportunities to be together. Let's take advantage of them. Amen. Got a picnic coming up. Yes. There. You see, we already did it. God bless you guys. Go love somebody. All right. All right.
right? Go love somebody. Oh, if any, oh, of course. If anyone, <laughs> bonehead. If anyone has any needs for anything, come up now. Prayer team, come on up. And let's be ready to pray for people. So if you've got a need, don't hold back. Don't hide. If there's something going on in your life you need help with, come on and ask for it. People are going to pray for you with faith and power. Okay? Come on up, prayer team. Right. And Otherwise, God we'll bless you. We'll see you later. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next week. If you don't need prayer, thanks for joining us. Have a blessed week. Be intentional.